Today we want to talk about, the topic is inviting God to church, but I want to talk a little bit about the nature of worship in particular. Um, Christian worship is response to a divine call. In other words, we don't initiate worship. That's one of the first things that a lot of people get wrong. The idea is that God has acted mightily. He has redeemed us in Christ. He has called us in that context, and so our worship is a response to him. Now, um, I believe that the church cannot be Christian without worship. Worship, in effect, is the most important function of the church. It's more important than preaching or teaching or discipleship or evangelism, and worship, therefore, has to be the church's priority. This is one of the reasons, as I've told you, I'm praying and thinking very hard about how we can make worship better in our church. I cringe every time somebody says to me, well, we come here on Sunday morning in order to hear you preach. You know, while on the one hand that may be very flattering, that's not the point. You know, it's not about coming and hearing what I think about something. Um, and so we really do need to make sure that we are worship oriented because that is what Christianity is about. Now, the need for worship is deeply rooted in the, I need to get a mirror so I can tell whether that changes or not. The need for worship is deeply rooted in all human beings. All people are natural worshipers. Um, and that's true even for those who claim no religion, who find themselves honoring persons or experiences they find transformative. Um, even they, non-religious people, will develop patterns of thought and action, which might be considered almost equivalent to rituals or, de or creeds, that help them order their lives. Um, the, one of the last lectures I did, I had a woman say to me, well, I don't really believe in organized religion. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. I don't mean to do her any justice. I don't really believe in organized religion, but I'm a very spiritual person. I'm going to talk about spiritual, but not religious in a minute. But um, she said, uh, you know, it's not organized religion. And part of my response was, organized religion is simply a formalizing of the ritual that we naturally develop. All people are ritualistic, you know, we're really ritualistic animals. We will develop rituals that way we drive to work, how we brush our teeth, you know, how we get ready for bed at night. Um, anything that we do that we repeat and consistently repeat becomes ritual for us. Well, all organized religion is, of all kinds, I'm not just talking about Christianity here now, is a formalizing of those natural rituals, the ways we find to do things. Okay, So people have a natural tendency, is my point in that. It's interesting even that atheists, among the new atheists, a conference they had in, in California, talking about the end of religion and, you know, the growth of atheism and the moving forward from there kind of thing. One woman who is a science, scientific atheist did a, a presentation in which she encouraged atheists, all those present, to participate in developing services and ceremonies and possibly even creeds that reflected their beliefs, which is exactly this point, that even non-religious people find themselves needing or wanting, at least, some sort of religious, sort of uh, ritualistic services. So human beings are natural worshipers. We naturally incline to pay homage to things that either provide order in our lives or give meaning to us. Um, we recognize things that give us continuing and ongoing kind of direction, and we want to keep coming back to those things. And that's what one way to understand what worship is. Now again, while human beings are inclined that way, and human beings have a natural tendency toward that, Christian worship, while it may reflect that human need, it does not begin with that human need. Worship begins with God, and then we respond as an attempt to honor God. So, worship that, that is rooted in Scripture, true worship, is not, first and foremost, um, us coming up with something. It is God inviting us, and then we respond. And our response, well, both God's invitation, that, that first half of it, and then our response, the second half, are together what make up worship. But God initiates it. Um, actually, I heard a guy one time say something I liked. He said, you know, we always think that we decide to approach God. He said the thing we need to realize is that when we first approach God, as we approach him and he responds to us, we realize that the first step was actually his. He stepped toward us before we were able to ever step toward him. Well, the same thing is true in worship. He initiates the desire in us. 
which may be inherent in the way we're made, in, in being in God's image, but that he initiates, he invites, and we then respond to that. So it's fundamental to, in understanding proper worship, I think, to realize that no matter how motivated we are to do it, worship is a response to God's initiative, what he does first, okay? Um, similarly, we can say that aspects of worship like prayer, praise, thanksgiving, and confession, while they're human acts of worship, they're also theological events. And what I mean by that is they are places where we see God at work. In other words, it's not like me just you know, singing in the shower where I'm just, I mean, it's possible I could, I could worship in the shower, but I'm talking about singing you know, a Beatles song in the shower. There is something more going on there. There is, God is active in the, in the events that, that make up our worship. Um, and all, again, all true worship is this dual directional thing. God invites, God approaches, he invites us, blesses us, and we respond in faith. And for that reason, I mean, if you understand theology to be defined as um, the study of God, you know, the, 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 what we understand about God, well, worship is one of the primary places in which theological stuff is happening. That's where we come in contact with God. That is where our knowledge of God happens. And um, so we recognize that our worship is two-sided. It's both a call from God and a response from us. But the origin and the goal is from God. Romans 11.36, Paul writes, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. So from him, through him, to him. Good description of worship. Okay. It starts from him. We receive the blessing and then we respond to him. And then he receives glory. But still, most people think, and it's it's not not inaccurate to say that worship has to do with the things that human beings do. Worship is our interaction with God, our response to God. But uh, it does have to do with certain things. Worship, as we ordinarily use the word, focuses on what groups of people do when they get together at particular times to recognize God and to, to fellowship with Him. It involves gathering, sitting, standing, kneeling, singing, praying, reciting scriptures or creeds. So there, there is content. You know, the first part of this is the object of religion, which is God's call to us in our response. But then there also is content, and we have to recognize that side of it. The difficulty with that we run into, quite often in our culture, I think, is that the content, the stuff we do, when I say content, I, I mean the, the activities that make up our hour of worship or however long it is, too often those become the thing we focus on. You know, we're more concerned about... Um, how many people are be taking up the offering than we are, why are we doing this as a, as a service to God, as a giving of thanks to God? So we need to be thoughtful about not just what worship looks like, what activities are going on, that is, but rather what kind of worship does God desire? What it, even what does he require of us? What does faithful worship look like? Um, and we miss that. We, again, we're ritualistic creatures. We get so wrapped up in the ritual, we start at 10, we finish as close to 11 as the preacher will let us, <laughs> unless he gets too long-winded. We do these things, you know, every time. Now, it's, again, humans are ritualistic creatures. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. But when that becomes the focus, rather than God's presence and our response to his presence becoming the focus, then we have gotten off track. And so much of, um, and it's, it's not really happening very much anymore, but for a long time, so much of the disagreement between contemporary worship and traditional worship. People could say, well, I feel more God's presence, blah, blah, blah. Fundamentally, it was a difference in how we did it, not what was happening. In other words, we, it was a difference in how we, what, func what activities we pursue, not whether or not God had invited us to be there and was present with us and asked us to respond to him. Okay. And so... That's the reason that that whole argument thing was, was way out of line, I think. That doesn't mean we don't have to be concerned about being um, doing things as Presbyterians say, decently and in order. In other words, having some understanding of the right of, of how we're going to do this, of not getting together and, and, you know, three hours later people are going, holy moly, when is he going to be done? There's a, a really fun song by Lyle Lovett called Church. Um, and... It, it, He's, he's a Lutheran Christian. I love it. I really like him. 
And he, the, the song Church is about how, you know, church is going on and the preacher's preaching, and everybody's getting hungry, and, you know, the weak ones are passing out, and the kids are, you know, and everybody wants to go. The preacher keeps preaching and preaching and preaching, and so he goes up to the choir, upstairs in the choir, and he's telling them, when I tell you, then, you know, and they're trying to get the preacher to stop preaching. Um, and the whole thing is, at a certain point, if you don't have some sensitivity to structure, including how long it goes, what the activities are, whether or not it's organized, then those things become a detriment if you're too loose, just like if you're too obsessed with it. If you're too loose, then those things get in the way of the real purpose of worship, which is the presence of God. Something that used to drive me crazy before I became a pastor of this church is they would have a responsive reading. I wasn't involved in it, but they would have a responsive reading. And every week they would get up there, and the person who's supposed to lead the reading and the, and the, the preacher, pastor who was coming down, they would look at each other, and they would, right there in front of everybody, during the worship service, they'd be trying to figure out, okay, do I start with the bold face type, and then they read the response, or do I do I do they do the bold faced, or do I do the? And every week they would do the same thing. They'd have this little dance, and every week, if everybody was feeling the presence of God, well, whether they were feeling the presence of God or not, everybody's distracted by the fact that they had not even week after week after week after week they would not decide who starts and who responds. I mean, you know, how's this going to work? Um, one of the first things I did when I came pastor was I said, okay, everybody. You know, you start with the leader, and then the bold face type is the response. And you, so you always start with the leader, you always end with the congregation, all right? No question, no discussion. We don't need to talk about this every week in front of the congregation during worship time. That sounds a little silly, but that really is one of the problems, is that if, you, if we don't pay enough attention, you know, we can pay too much attention to the process. If we don't pay enough attention to it, though, it in itself gets in the way. So there's that balance in there. One thing that we tend to do, though, and again, this is reflective, I think, of a lot of the worship wars that went on for a while, is we tend to take for granted that what we're used to thinking about worship, um, we're used to taking for granted what we think about worship and how we do it. We imagine that our practices, the ones that we're familiar with, are the normative ones. In other words, we do it the right way. Everybody else is doing something weird. Okay? Humans do that about everything. But... Those who are in traditional services can't believe all that loud music that those crazy people, especially the young ones, are doing. When are they going to stop that? And all the young ones are saying, what is wrong with those old people singing those crappy old boring hymns? All right? We think our way is right. I mean, human beings think that about everything, but it seems like we do that almost more in church than anything else. And much of that is dependent upon the fact that we have come to believe that worship should satisfy my needs, our own personal needs, or the needs of our family. In other words, worship is invariably a personal thing. In fact, almost an entirely personal thing. If I don't, you know, if I'm not feeling it at a given church, I'll look for a different one. All right? My old, my old friend Richard, used, you know, when he said to me that time, I, I, don't, I don't care for the church, I don't enjoy church, I don't like the church, and I'm not going there anymore. And I said to him, well, that's awfully selfish. You may not think they need you, or you need them, but maybe they need you. The idea is, we all think that way. That this church is here to satisfy my needs. To meet my needs. And the music needs to be the kind that I find fulfilling. And the rest of the service needs to be what I like. And the preacher needs to touch me where I feel I need to be touched. Not some other way. That's a very Western idea. That church should meet my needs, and if it doesn't, I'll go someplace else. It was very much more customary in the history of the church, and not just the early church, but up until 50 or 50 to 100 years ago, even in the United States, that there would typically be one church in a community, the parish church. If there were multiple denominations, I mean, if you ever listen to um, Prairie Home Companion, you know, uh, Garrison Keillor, he talks about like Wobegon. Okay, and there's a Catholic church, Our Lady of Perpetual Responsibility, it's called. There's a Lutheran church, because there's all these Scandinavian Lutherans there. And I think there's a Presbyterian church, and that's it. It's not like you, you know, you've got 50 churches to choose from, and you're one of those flavors. And you go to that church, and you, whether you like them or not, you relate to everybody in that church. Well, that used to be the way it was everywhere. Even here, with as few English language people as we have, relatively speaking, in Ahihi, in Ahihik, We've got, I think, six English language churches here. And so, I don't like that one, I'll go to that one. I don't like that one, I'll go to that one. This whole church shopping kind of thing. 
find, trying to find a church. Now, there is nothing wrong with trying to find a church that you feel is theologically accurate, that is, you know, is biblically oriented, etc. But we have to be careful that the difference between those very legitimate, you know, being on target or not on target for church, versus my personal preference, you know, what what style do I like? Not is the theological content accurate? That has become a, a real problem in our culture, where this church has a responsibility to, to make me feel good on Sunday morning, to give me what I need, not to worship God and to present Him, you know, in a right way, so that people are growing and people are being led into, into a, a greater knowledge of the kingdom. And we have done that. Can I get an amen? <laughs> is, that, is that not true? Um, even asking for an amen is a particular cultural kind of <laughs> stylistic. <laughs> so religion in general, and worship in particular, necessarily, and here's just an acknowledgement, necessarily conforms to basic cultural realities and it occupies particular cultural spaces. Now it's true that the kind of church, worship, you know, religious expression that we have, let's say in the United States, is going to be different than what they have in Korea. I can remember a woman came from Korea, um, went to, came to seminary. Uh, she's from South Korea. She came to seminary at um, Fuller when I was there. On Friday nights, we had a, a fellowship time, and we would have a prayer time. And the, the, the group usually lasted an hour to an hour and a half. Well, after an hour and 20 minutes or something, you know, we had people had been praying for a while, and finally the guy who was leading said amen. And Everybody started standing up and, you know, talking to each other and saying, let's go get a cup of coffee. And this young woman from South Korea said, is that it? You know, she said, when we get together for, for fellowship and prayer in, in my church in Korea, we go all night. Now, how would the people here, or in the U.S., uh, Mexicans might be, would be much better with it than we are, but uh, I've... I said to you before, I've gone an hour and five minutes before and had somebody who was in leadership at that time come up to me afterwards and say, you've got to make sure you end at, one, you know, at 11 o'clock. You, you can't go long. And I'm thinking, five minutes is such a value that, that, I mean, this is such a cultural value that it can only be one hour and not five minutes more that they felt they needed to correct me on that. Well, I don't, I don't pay attention to that. You know, I try to be reasonable in the time because... People make other commitments, they have other plans, I recognize that, but, you know, if I feel like I need to go an hour or five, an hour and ten, an hour and fifteen, I'm not going to let that be, the, you know, break the bank. But some people do, and you can see the difference. There, there, there are simple cultural realities in what, terms of what people will expect, um, and that those cultural realities are particular to place quite often, and to the cultures within those places, and we recognize all of that. You, I think we need to push those boundaries sometimes when it's necessary and appropriate, but recognize that if you push it to the point of breaking, then you're throwing the baby out of the bathwater. So where do we find the balance between how far we recognize that? Lydia? Well, wouldn't that be the ones that get 50D or whatever after an hour? What exactly are they worshiping? Yeah, exactly. Are they worshiping God or worshiping where they Right. And I think, I think their priorities are messed up. Why are they here? And I, I would want to ask them that. On the other hand, you know, um, we, someday somebody I'm referring to is going to see the videos, I'm sure. But um, my father-in-law goes to a church. Actually, it stopped because he has trouble getting out now. But um, for a long time, and the minister there has been there for 20 some years, 26 years, I think he said. And people really like him. He's grown the church. In many ways, he's a good guy. I think he's theologically mostly on target. I disagree with some of his political politicizing of things. But every time I've been there, he, he gets up and he's very freelance in his preaching. In fact, a couple of times, I haven't heard him that many times, a couple of times I've heard him say, well, I forgot my notes. You know? And my reaction to it is that every week that I've been there, he, he has a a good solid 20 or 25 minute sermon, but he takes 45 minutes to preach it. And so, see, that, that's my problem, is because of preaching, I find my, I have to just fight this idea of sitting there critiquing, you know, and, would you tighten it up, kind of thing, you know? So, we all, we all have some of that. It's not that I want to get done in an hour, it's just at what point is it that 
we're just being undisciplined is why we're going an hour and a half or two hours versus is it really an act of worship? So you see that there are really different ways to see it. One of the realities, though, is that Christians almost universally believe that their created and cultural situation is also important to God. They may not say that, and if you call them, what I mean is, God loves hymns more than he does tradition, the, the contemporary music. Or, we're doing it this way because this is what God wants us to do. We assume that the structures that are culturally appropriate to us, that we're comfortable with, that we feel are meeting our personal needs or the needs of our family, that those also are God's preference. And we need to call that into a question. You know, does God really prefer our Presbyterian service, which goes an hour, an hour and five minutes, more than an African service where they dance and play drums and will go for four hours? Something that might drive us crazy? You know? <laughs> Really? Do we really? And, and I think subconsciously, most of this is not, and the reason we're talking about it is because I think we have to be more conscious of it. We need to bring it to, to the surface and realize where we're coming from. Just like we say the people who get, get fidgety after an hour, we need to call them to task and say, why is this bothering you that we're going an hour and ten minutes or an hour and five minutes? We need to be aware that so many of our assumptions about what is right worship, what is appropriate process in worship, that it's not simply because we have assumed that God approves of how we do it more than he approves of how somebody else is doing it. That may be very different. Okay? But it is true, if we're doing it right, that worship is charged with the presence of God. If worship is real worship, that is, it is God calling us and us responding in relationship to him, then People who come into this experience cannot be passive or uninvolved unless they are doing it with, you know, completely oblivious to the presence of God. If we believe that God is present in worship and we are gathering as a group in worship, then anybody who comes there and just, and I, I can see everybody on Sunday morning, and I see the people who never sing, who never participate in the responsive reading, who... You know, it's clear that their priority is that they want to get home and see the football game. And so they hope I don't go along because pregame starts right at 11. Or whatever. I don't know when it starts. And I can see a lot of that. You know, and there's a part of me that wants to say, hey, you! You know, from time to time, I will make some comment about, you know, um, why aren't you singing more? I try to be lighthearted and funny about it or whatever. But... Um, People who come and have no investment, no involvement, no participation, that are completely passive, they are apparently unaware that God is there, that God is present. And so the obvious question to ask them is then, if you don't realize that that's what's going on, why are you really here? Did your spouse make you come? You know, uh, are you just... You love those cookies we serve after the service and you just can't wait to get some more or what, what's going on? But we need to ask ourselves those questions. You know, we need to challenge ourselves on that. Um, one of the things too that's kind of helpful is in modern Protestant times, there are a couple of different major uh, forces. When we talk about that it's, are the, is it meeting my needs? Is it, you know, you know it's personal and then... That's what's of value to God, is that I'm getting my needs met. Recognizing that that is fairly unique to the West, there are some, a number of different forces that have been involved in creating this particular American, North American tendency to think that way, in personal and individualistic kind of terms. The, the Puritan uh, movement, the Reformation movement, they, you know, they created much more a sense of, it's not just that I'm signed on with the church, but that I have a personal commitment to God, all right, so that's one of the things that has sort of fed into that, but even more so, following that, the Enlightenment context, the sort of the rationalism of the Enlightenment, which focused on people being autonomous, you know, that we are all self, um, self-creating, that we are responsible for ourselves as, as rational, unique beings, and I'm not like anybody else. Well, you combine those things, a focus on a personal relationship with God from the Reformation and the Puritan movements, and a focus on me being autonomous and self-creating and self-determining you know, that came from the Enlightenment. You put those two things together, and I think that's some of what has fed us into this idea that the, 
purpose of worship is to make me receive what I, you know, what I want, what I need, to keep me wanting to be here. Because if you guys aren't cutting the mustard in terms of making this an exciting thing and, and appropriate to what I desire, I'm out of here. Like that line from uh, the Whoopi Goldberg movie, the two bikers room, and the nuns come in and one of them looks at the other biker and he says, oh, this turns into a nun bar, I'm out of here. Okay, uh, I quoted that before, I've always thought that's funny. Um, but different, different religious traditions will see that differently. Bottom line is, I think we have paid too little critical attention to what has led us to our current approach to worship. The cultural and traditional patterns that have brought us here. And I, I think that we've not paid enough attention in two reasons, in, in two directions. One, we've not paid enough attention to realize that there are some negative, even nefarious influences that have crept in, like the enlightenment thing, that it's all about me. All right, the me idea. We don't, we're not aware enough of what's going on to recognize those negative parts, but in the same way, we're not aware enough to realize that there are certain kinds of cultural bridges, certain things we share, and if we're, we're aware of that, we can use those to advantage in terms of building more bridges with the people who are present here and the people who may be in the community that haven't gotten here yet. So both of those, either not recognizing the negative or not recognizing the positive, both are a result of us not being aware enough of what exactly we're doing and what has brought us to this place, the culture, the traditions, and those sorts of things. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions about any of that? Yes, Chris. Yeah, okay. My experience with church is different than most. Like, I haven't been involved so much in actual church services and stuff. So a lot of this you could be. You could come on something. Yeah, no, sorry. A lot of this is new to me, so, but I do have a couple of questions. <clears throat> Let's say there's three churches, all are theologically equal, in that either all three of them, you know, really have, or all three of them have. I'd love to see that be the case. Yeah, but okay, little, <laughs> theologically. Little, you know, each one has a little thing that maybe. Yeah. That you could argue. Um, one of them is more, you know, the music, the preaching and stuff is more alive. Than other, you know, they kind of scale. Well, in a case like that, I mean, I know it's not your, it's not for you because you're going to worship God, but if you find that one of those theologically correct churches suits how you prefer, or how you have learned, or whatever the case may be. The style works for you. This, which style works for you, then you're not doing it for you, but there certainly is a style that, that all things being equal, you would prefer that style. Right. I, absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I, I think that I don't think that the existence of denominations in the Protestant churches, for instance, is necessarily a bad thing. God understands that some people are more moved and are made more aware of his presence by, for instance, a high liturgy, you know, an evangelical Anglican church or something of that sort. Um, others are more moved by a much more free-form sort of worship, you know, a charismatic worship, etc. And assuming that they are all theologically accurate, which is very hard to, you know, to get a bunch of churches to do that, then I think that's fine. I think that we are all made, you know, uh, we're all different in some way. And if there are aspects of a particular church that makes us feel more worshipful, great. I think there are other factors we need to consider. Like, you know, God has given each of us gifts. Where can I best use the gifts God has given me? And that may be in a church that, you know, the style isn't quite is, you know, you don't find it as, as fun or satisfying or whatever, but you know that this is a place where you can really be used of service to the kingdom and to people, is, then I think that should be weighed. Um, I think the theological, you know, when we say, okay, there are three churches that are all theologically equal, that almost never happens, okay? And yet very few people will look at a church and say, are, is this church biblical? Is it, you know, is it consistent with what Jesus taught, with what Scripture says? People don't usually ask those questions, but sometimes they do, but they don't usually ask those questions when they decide to attend or not attend to church. Instead, they'll say, I don't like the music, or, um, you know, the people in that church dress money, or whatever, not realizing that that's, the devil uses that. In the Screwtape Letter, C.S. Lewis's book, 
the, the screw tape advises his nephew, who's a, a younger tempter, you know, have your client, the guy who's recently become a Christian, have him pay attention to how people are dressed and weird hairstyles and keep him focused on that kind of stuff, and then he won't be aware of the presence of God. Um, and so that's very real. So all other things being equal, yes, there is nothing wrong with finding a church th that the style of worship is one that you find especially fulfilling, because worship should be fulfilling. But there are other factors that we should take into account, like where can we serve best. Now, I have been, I and this church, but particularly I, have been roundly criticized in this community for stealing sheep is the expression they use. Because our church has grown till I'm pretty sure we're the biggest, biggest English language church in, in the community now. And we have this wonderful new building and all of that. And a lot of those people came from other churches. And so I've had people, in fact, one of our dear sisters here, the first time she met me, she really did not like me because she thought that that's what it did. Well, she's, you know, she, she and I are great friends now. She's one of the greatest supporters and of me. But she thought I was, I was actively trying to get people to leave other churches. I have, to the best of my knowledge, never invited anyone to come to our church who is currently attending another church. And those of you who come here know that I pray for the other churches every week. Um, but, as I have often said when I've been asked about this, we do not steal sheep. I don't steal sheep. But, if a sheep shows up at our door and say, says, I'm starving to death in the pasture I'm in right now, can I please come over to your pasture and get fed? I'm not going to say no. I'm not going, no, you've, you've attended the Baptist church more than three times, you have to stay there, or the Anglican church, or the Assemblies of God Church or whatever. And that's, you know, but to me it's very clear. I do not, I pray for the other churches. I wish them the best. I do not invite people to leave there and come here. Um, I, even though I don't think all of them are theologically completely accurate. I don't think all of them are, you know, there's some churches in our community I don't think accurately reflect the Spirit of Christ and how they relate to people. Um, there's at least one church that I think is evil. Okay? <laughs> Not to put too fine a point on it, in terms of the people who, who are in charge there. Um, but that doesn't, you know, I still don't go there and try to encourage the people to come here. And so, people do have to make that call. I think the first priority is, are they biblical in their approach? Are they theologically accurate? Um, is, is this a place I can serve based upon the gifts God has given me and what he's called me to do? When all those other things are met, and it's a choice between two churches or three churches, then I think that the style that you find most fulfilling, there's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly all right. Is that fair? Yeah, very Did you have other questions? No, I have a comment for later. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, now, speaking of theological content, I said that it certainly is rare to have multiple churches in, in a community our size, all of which are e theologically equal. I mean, I just that has not been my experience, unfortunately. I'd love it if all the churches had their theology right. But one of the things we need to recognize is that worship necessarily involves both theological content and practical form. Right? Worship, now notice what I said, worship has theological content. In fact, the elements of worship actually reflect the relationship between theological content and practical form, that is between theology and practices. Any, I'm talking now about group worship, not, in, not private worship at all. Um, the worship is the place where our theology and our, how we live out the practices of our faith come together. There's an ancient conviction, it really is very, very old, early church, that the church, uh, the worship of the church is primary theology. I use quotes around that because that means that's where our theology begins. Worship is the primary theology. Formal theological language, in other words, the doing of theology, actually is a secondary reflection, and it is always built on the language of worship and prayer. In other words, worship comes first. Theology follows that. The theology is both invested in and is reflected by the worship practices we have. The early church actually, they started with worship before they had any formal theology. That is, that's true for any church that's got things in the right order. Worship comes first. Now, for me, somebody who's very theologically oriented, who is very teacher oriented, who is very rational, you know, I 
I'd like to think, in my approach to things, that's something I need to, you know, that's the reason why this is important to me and why I've been praying about it and thinking about it and considering, you know, what we can do to make our worship more fulfilling in our church because my natural tendency is more toward the cognitive, the rational, rather than to the more heart response to God. But the fact is we start with worship first, primary theology, and out of that we reflect our more technical, cognitive, theological premises, right? Um, in that way, a person's prayer may be a better indicator of his or her beliefs than the specific statements of faith. A person's practice of prayer reflects his or her theological convictions because prayer indicates not just what people say they believe, but what they actually believe. You can say anything. How are you living that out in your relationship with God? Which means, how are you living that out in terms of your worship? I mean, there's practical service aspects, but in terms of your actual interaction with God, which is worship, what does that say about what you really believe? People who never pray, people who never worship, who then say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, you know, hmm, what do you understand that to mean if you don't pray, you don't worship, you don't join with other believers, you don't do any of that? Because those are the things that really reflect what we believe. There's, a, again, an old saying in Latin, um, lex orandi, lex credenti, which says, as we pray, so we believe. That's a very old saying of the church. So not what we say we believe, but what we actually believe, as is reflected more in our worship, how we act, how we respond to the call of God, to be in a relationship with Him on a regular basis. So, lex orandi, lex credendi. How, as we pray, so we believe. Our belief is ordered by our prayer, our worship. And, and prayer, in some ways, is almost synonymous with worship. Because prayer, in the proper understanding of it, is to, to commune with God. Actually, the word prosukomai, the New Testament word that is most often translated prayer, literally means to to ask God to join with us in something. It doesn't mean us giving him a list of things. It's, it means for us to invite God to, to, you know, to join us in, you know. But again, the request is always his first. He, he invites us to do that. And then we take it seriously in terms of asking God to participate with us in that. Understanding that there are different words for prayer is how we, you know, when, when the man who had a, a child who was demon-possessed who brings the boy to uh, Jesus, and, and the scripture says the, the apostles had prayed for this boy, but they were unsuccessful. And Jesus says, bring the boy to me, and he prays for him, the demon leaves, you know, the boy is fine, he releases him to his father. And after that, the apostles say to Jesus, why couldn't we drive out this demon? Because they've been successful in driving out other demons. And the English translation always is, this one only comes out with much prayer. Well, the word they used for prayer, the, the apostles, was to make a request of. The word Jesus uses for prayer is prosukomai, which means this one only comes out with much inviting of God to be involved. And so there's a fundamental difference. You, you, you read that in English and you go, what's the difference? I mean, what is Jesus saying different than what they said? Well, he, there's a different word for the kind of prayer he's talking about. So in that regard, when we understand prayer in that sense, prayer is worship. And we can use the terms prayer and worship almost interchangeably. Because they involve, God has invited, we respond, we participate with him. In either communication, communion of prayer, or in worship communion. Okay? Questions about any of that? Okay? We're good so far? Gosh, with fewer people here, I don't have as much to say. <laughs> All right, um, now this priority of worship that I talked about, that it is our primary theology, it is where we start, it is foundational, before even we write theology, before we have a cognitive explanation for what we believe, that priority of worship is evident not only in the history of the church, but also in scripture. You know, many, many times in scripture, it talks about worship happening, this was with the, the Hebrew people, this was true in the New Testament. You know, they would gather for worship um, in the Solomon's colonnade at the temple. The Christians would gather there for a time of worship. No theology books, Christian theology books have been written yet. No Christian theology had been written yet. 
but they would gather for worship. It was out of that experience of worship they began to articulate the nature of what they believed. They began to write their theology, and Scripture records that. Much of Scripture, both Old and New Testament, is actually, even though we don't always recognize it as that, is actually a record of acts of worship. A number of times in Paul, he gives these sort of benediction kinds of things. Um, and usually it follows him with an amen. And you don't even realize what he's done is he's just fallen into a, a worship act there. He has just made a statement of blessing or benediction, something that would be an act of worship. Um, in the Old Testament, the whole book of Psalms is a worship book. It was a song book intended to guide people in worship of God. And so Old and New Testament is full of very specific worship kinds of indications. All of the different, in fact, we quote them often, um, Old Testament and New Testament, these bits and pieces that sound so poetic and that so, you know, so the ones that we have calligraphy, you know, that we hang on our walls, etc. In almost every case, the ones that have this beautiful sort of poetry and ringing, those were worship words originally. And that's why we find them so attractive, is we, we can sense that in them. Um, as we said before, worship invariably is, looks in both directions. It is both remembrance and it is anticipation. It is remembering what God has done. For the, the Hebrews, for instance, it was remembering what God had done in the call of Abraham, but most especially in the Exodus, bringing the people up out of Egypt, the great act of salvation for them, and the promise of what God was going to do. Now, for us, it is especially the remembrance of what God did in Jesus Christ in his sacrifice for us, his redemption, and then the anticipation of his return. When we have the, the words of institution for the sacraments included in those words, and which is a, it's, it's, um, a recollection of what Jesus had done for us, but the words of institution include the words, you know, as you eat this bread and drink this cup in faith, you, uh, you know, you just lost it. How many times have I said this? Um, you uh, recognize him until he's coming again. So what he has done, he is coming again. Remembrance and anticipation. And similarly, as I said earlier, it is the two-sided call and response. God calls us to himself, and we respond in worship. So in each case, the, the universality in terms of human experience of worship is quite extraordinary. It is everything that God has done in the past and everything he has promised to do in the future. It is God speaking to us and us responding to him. It is both directions horizontally and both directions vertically, which is quite extraordinary. In the Old Testament, God invited acts of worship, of singing and praise. You know, the, the, the Psalms come, you know, come before the, the Lord with song into his presence with, you know, with hymns and songs and you know, the playing of instruments. I never have understood the churches, like some, some of the branches of the Church of Christ, who do not believe in musical instruments. I recently read a guy, a theologian I respect a lot, who said he didn't believe in musical instruments in the church either. And I'm thinking, really? You've thrown everything in the Old Testament where David talks about using all of these? Some of those instruments, we don't even know what they are anymore. But if we could find them, we should use them. Okay. Um, the, the flute and lyre and sackbuts and all kinds of stuff. I don't, I cannot imagine, I do not understand any theological justification for us not believing that musical instruments should be used in worship now, um, that it can only be singing. My grandmother went to a church like that, and very weird, um, sorry, <laughs> very weird, it's not a very good theological assessment, but, um, so, all of that, the acts of worship, the singing, the praising in the Old Testament <laughs> reflected the fact that God was present with them, and you remember, for instance, when he gave them the design well, after all Mount Sinai, he gave them the design, and afterwards when they constructed the tabernacle, which was a precursor to the temple, he gave them very specific instructions as to how it was to be built and what the different parts of it were and what the different implements would be. You know, the, the sea, which, which had water in it, and the, the uh, altar, and the censers, and the whole thing. You know, the idea of there being a holy of holies, and, you know, the, um, all of those things were directions to worship. And that became the center of their, um, of the Israelites' worship until the time of the building of the temple under Solomon, much later. And you will remember that the presence of God, we said that it was God's presence among his people, that they, God appeared as a pillar of cloud by day, so that, and it was always over the tabernacle. 
you know, and, and would, would hang over the tabernacle. And then the column of fire by night, the pillar of fire by night, so that at night they could see it too, that God's presence was always there with them, and it was focused on the tabernacle. So that their worship, which was directed at through the tabernacle um, ritual, was focused on the presence of God. And in fact, in Jeremiah, when because of the sinfulness of the, the, the people of Judah, after this is in 586 BC, um, Jeremiah describes seeing the glory of God, the Shekinah of God, which is the, 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 the presence of his glory, literally rising up from the temple and departing before the city and the temple were destroyed by the Babylonians. And, you know, you can imagine how Jeremiah felt about that. He'd been trying to get the people to straighten up all that time. And for him to see the Shekinah glory of God leave the temple, the presence of God had departed from, from the people of Judah. The people of the northern kingdom of Israel had been destroyed 140, 150 years before that. 134 years before that. Um, so... The presence of God has always been the focus. The New Testament, then, continues the emphasis on God's initiative. The presence of God was manifested perfectly in the presence of Jesus Christ in the Incarnation and reflected in the life and work of Jesus. The presence of God, while it, you know, in the Old Testament it departed in 586 from the temple, 586 years later it returned to humanity in the person of the incarnate Christ. And then continued with the people. And when Jesus was ascended into heaven, a very short time after that, the presence of God again visited those who would follow him in the presence of the Holy Spirit. So the presence of God has always, in one way or another, you know, there was that brief, brief interlude in there, the dark period between the last of the, you know, the destruction of the temple, the last of the prophets, and the coming of Christ. Um, but... The presence of God has always been there, and that has been the motivation for worship. All right? So the early church began its life by singing its faith, and that was a spontaneous response to God's redemptive act in Christ. The question I had in the first class this morning, why did they shift from Saturday, the Jews, to Sunday? Well, because Jesus represented the very presence of God with them. And so for their worship, they felt anything they could do to emphasize it was Christ who was God in their midst, including moving their day of worship to the day of his resurrection, which was the great sign of his, his redemption for them. That's why they did that. And all of it reflective of the fact that Christ was God with them. And it was out of that practice of worship all of those different pieces of the worship of the New Testament that then theological reflection and then theological writing came. We didn't start with our theology being formalized and then figured out how to worship with it. And again, that's one of the problems we have today is we, we, we tend, our tendency is to want to start with our theological understanding, assume we're thinking about it at all, which too often people don't, and then say, okay, now let's create a worship to fit around that. Instead of saying we need to worship and then our theology comes out of that. It really is an interactive kind. Okay, any questions about that? Why don't we take a break for a few minutes? I want to talk a little bit now about worship today and kind of where people's understanding of worship is. Um, some people have said, especially because of the kind of renewal, although there was a lot of frustration with it, the kind of renewal that came because of the growth of contemporary worship, the sense is that the, the, the wars, the fights between contemporary and traditional, has pretty much died down. That's not a big issue anymore. Churches have either gone one direction or the other, or in many cases they have tried to do a blended kind of service, which is sort of what we do. I mean, I, most of our songs are traditional because it's, it's traditional hymns, but given our congregation. But every week we use at least one much more contemporary praise kind of song. And in fact, the hymnals that we chose, the Worship and Rejoice, we chose that specifically because that hymnal is intended to have both traditional hymns and more contemporary praise songs in it. That's why it's called Worship and Rejoice. The Worship is the traditional side and the Rejoice is the more contemporary side. And so we try to do blended or some churches have gone to having multiple services where they will do one or the other at different services so people can choose. Um, so much of the 
this sort of conflict has ended. Some people will say that even in that conflict, there ended up being more attention paid to worship and more thoughtful uh, focus on what worship is and how it's done, so that there may be still a renewal taking place in parts of the church with focus on, on uh, worship itself. Uh, but even given that, that there, let's assume that there, there is a continuing, although somewhat slowed down, renewal movement in worship in churches, there are a number of factors that we need to realize uh, are, that exist in the world today that are huge factors in terms of influencing. And this, this goes back to what I said a minute ago about our lack of awareness about what factors, traditional and cultural factors, uh, affect how we worship and how we think worship ought to be done. The fact that we're not even aware of that causes problems, either because we're not aware of problems that have crept in or we're not aware of potential, either negative or positive. Well, the first of those is the ever-increasing power of the media and the entertainment industries. This has been one of the criticisms that has been made of the contemporary uh, Christian worship movement because it has become very commercial. Uh, one writer referred to the Hillsongization of worship because one of the biggest uh, contemporary worship companies, they produce videos and, and uh, music, sheet music, all kinds of things, is Hillsong out of, uh, from Australia. And so I'm not, I'm not being critis critical of them at all. I think they do some wonderful things. But the question of how much, to what extent, have we allowed commercial media, entertainment-based media kinds of things, to influence our worship? I mean, let's face it. We know the influence of television. We know the influence of movies, television even more so nowadays. Um, and that everybody is exposed to that. And the reality is that we come to expect that the same level of entertainment, if you will, the same level of excitement or titillation is probably too strong a word, but the idea that we get, you know, that it's the, it's, it's yeah, the entertainment factor, how much of that have we allowed to come into our worship? And that the more we use multimedia shows, the more we use, um, you know, Worship leaders have become major stars. In, in they, rec they have recording contracts, they have videos. How much of that do we need to be concerned about? You know, and I mean, look behind you. We have two huge screens and two projectors, and we're talking about getting a third one in our sanctuary. Um, the, the only thing we pretty much use that for is we, we use, in the English language service, we use projection of lyrics and, and the responsive reading, etc. In the Spanish language service, they are using um, music videos and stuff like that to lead, to lead music, especially since we don't have a band anymore for right now. But um, Sometimes we use it some parts of, of movie pictures. For exactly, them. yeah. Um, and when I say we're thinking of getting a third one, just so you know what I'm saying, I saw you looking around, Lydia. We're talking about getting a lar the largest of the three screens, electric screen in the center, so it would be up. So that when we have, like, um, Friday Night Movies here and Monday Night Football, I mean, we want to have events that we invite people to for social things. That having a, a screen in the center and another projector in the center, a larger screen that we can bring down, um, We've discovered that while we had good intention, that the screens on the side are fine, and we, we want the cross, we want the altar table, we want all that stuff to be visible during worship. But when we're doing something social, it, it makes more sense to have a screen in the middle. Okay, so that's why we're talking about that. Not that we would use it for worship. Yes? Did you turn it on? I did. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I better have. I pushed the button, and I think it said red. Just a second. Yeah, it's, it's recording. Uh, thank you. So, how much have we allowed the power of the media and entertainment industry to influence our worship? Are we confusing the experience that we have in entertainment, watching TV or a movie or a concert, have we confused that with the experience we have when we come to worship? Mm -hmm. right. Sometimes, in some words, they create directly the service to the television. Okay. And you can see your big house to the exactly. television. You, you, know, you don't need to come here. Right, exactly. And to what extent, I mean, obviously that's a great service to people who are homebound, who are sick or disabled or can't get out. Um, you know, there, there's some great advantages to that. But 
how do we balance that against the fact that people who otherwise could and should be in church decide just to stay home? You know, I can, you know, I can stay in my pajamas, I can, you know, eat, eat cereal out of the box and wear my comfy slippers and still watch the, watch the church service. How much of that? So we need to be sensitive to that. That's one of the concerns, the real concerns, that has come especially lately. And the more we have focused on, as I say, the commercialization of the contemporary music scene, the more that, is, you know, that has become... Uh, I, I remember when contemporary Christian music just started. I mean, I went to concerts by Barry McGuire. You guys even know who Barry McGuire is. He was one of the very first Christian, contemporary Christian. He and, and Larry, um, I want to say Larry Kraft, he's an art, uh, a writer. I'll think of it and it starts with a C. Um, anyway, and, and Barry McGuire became a Christian very early on. There's fascinating stories about that. He had been a folk singer. His big hit was Eve of Destruction. And uh, there's a great line in Eve of Destruction. He says, you know, we had three day parties twice a week. <laughs> Which was, I always thought was cool. Um, and he became a believer uh, through the influence of some other rock musicians who had become Christians. And um, so I, I remember when it just started, and then we get you know, all of the, the um, Amy Grants, you know, um, all, all of the different people coming along. But now, even then, even in the big, the heyday of Amy Grant, all that stuff, it still wasn't the level of commercial. I mean, they were selling a lot of albums and stuff. But nowadays, that the contemporary Christian music scene is as big a business as the rock scene or any other major music genre. So what effect does that have? And not only what effect does it have on the church, but what effect does it have on us? Does it lead us to believe that we should be experiencing that same kind of excitement or entertainment on Sunday mornings? Um, as we would have if we go to a concert. See, one of the problems when I say that there are people who, you know, who stand up and, you know, because we make them, pretty much, unless they're in a wheelchair or something, um, they stand up, they don't sing, they don't recite the... I think some of that is because we have been conditioned that um, we, don't have, we don't respond to things. We watch a football game on TV, they don't expect us to make the calls, you know? They don't expect us to run the ball, they don't expect us to be actively involved in it. Anything else that we witness on a movie screen or a TV screen, now unfortunately too many people talk in movie theaters now, but we aren't actually, we're passive recipients of that entertainment. Prior to even the contemporary Christian music scene, there was a danger of Christians doing that in worship, that we end up going there to be observers rather than participants. Well, there's some concern that the contemporary Christian music commercialization has made that even worse. Um, and that if we're not being entertained, there's one more reason why we don't want to go. So that's a major issue. A second one, is the modern love for spirituality, but a mistrust of religion and of worship, therefore. Um, that worship, while it expresses spirituality, is necessarily embodied in religious forms. People want to worship. They want to be spiritual. But I don't like all this formality. Okay? People who say that liturgical churches are really bad. High liturgy churches, that is. As Lou Smead said to me one time in seminary, I said something about I was attending an Anglican church, Episcopal church. And I said, yeah, I'm attending a liturgical church. And he said, well, all churches have liturgy. Some have good liturgy and some have bad liturgy. But they all have liturgy. Because liturgy is what you do. It's the, it's the process. Well, a lot of people today will say, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Even Christian people. I don't really like the organized religion. I don't like the formality of the services. But I just want to be sort of free-form worship of God. Well, I think you can see the danger of that with regard to worship in churches. People are, you know, people have a sense that, that I want it to be something that will lead me in worship. And all this stuff, the responsive reading and the, you know, reading of that Old Testament stuff, and the, you know, it's taking up an offering. You're taking, you focus on money, right? Well, we focus on it being an act of thanksgiving for all the blessings God's given. But people will say, that's not spiritual. That's just religious stuff. Um, I have often, often said, in fact, the woman, one of the women in the last, the same woman who I mentioned earlier was saying, um, 
well, you're talking about all these organized religions, you know, and, and I, I don't really like organized religions, but I'm spiritual. I have a relationship with God. And I said that religion is a formalizing of the rituals that we naturally develop. But I also said, I said, I don't mean to offend you by this, but this is something I have often said. When somebody says they're spiritual but not religious, I think what it really means is they want all of the benefits but none of the responsibilities. They want to have the wonderful feelings and the sense of God's presence. They want to be spiritual, but they don't want to have to show up at a certain time or go through certain you know, processes or participate in, in things that are more formalized. They don't want to take the responsibility on that involves participating in that. Now, it's, to me, it's not either spirituality or, or religion. Our spirituality, if we're doing it right, is reflected through the processes which we would call formal religion. Okay. But there is such a tendency, I hear that, I mean, I've heard that a hundred times in the last year. And I try to be gracious and not say to all of them, well, when you say you're spiritual but not religious, I think that means you want all the benefits and none of the responsibilities. But I think that's true. Okay? We just want, we just want the icing. We don't want to have to deal with the cake. And that's a major concern today because our society has moved very much in that direction. As a response to the idea that we are very individualistic, we want our personal needs to be, personal spiritual needs to be met, worship calls forth deep feelings. We have to recognize that. Feelings are a big part of this. But ultimately, finally, we have to be very direct in saying that our personal, my or your, an individual's quest for an encounter with God or with the spiritual is ultimately not the point. It's not all about me or you. It is about God, and God has invited us into his presence, but when we start thinking, oh, I just didn't, that worship didn't do anything for me, as though that makes it not worship. If God was present and other people felt his presence, then maybe the problem isn't with them, Maybe it's with you. But we never go there. We never think that way. We think, you know, I, I need my personal spiritual needs met. And if not, then there's something wrong with that church or with that minister or with those people or whatever. And we need to, we need to challenge that. That real spirituality, real worship is not a quest for our own individual satisfaction in a service. Worship orients itself around the particular things that God has done in history and is primarily about the things that Christians do in the presence of God. In other words, it's not about me right now to, you know, this Sunday in this place. It is a much bigger thing. It is about God. It is about what God has done historically. Remember? Remembrance and anticipation. And it is about the body of Christ, which is more than just me, coming together in the presence of God to acknowledge His presence and to commune with Him. And if I'm the outlier, then it's not their fault. If I'm not getting it, then I need to say, what's wrong with me? If there is another church that I feel like is, does, that's theologically equal, that is equally a place that I can use the gifts that God has given me to serve, then there is nothing wrong with seeking that church out. But if we seek it out because we go, that church just doesn't do anything for me anymore, as though there's something wrong with the church, we need to, you know... And, and quite often, in my experience, people who say things like that or feel that way, they'll like the other church for a month, and then they'll be unhappy with that. And then they'll go to another church for a month, and then or a week, maybe, and then be unhappy with that. And they're going to keep church hopping. That's what we call it. When that happens, almost invariably, the problem is not with the churches. It's with the person. And we need to, we need to call ourselves on that. TV show... Justified. Caroline's heard me refer to this before, and you guys may have as well. Um, the, the head, so it's about uh, these marshals, U.S. marshals. And the guy who's the head of the marshal office in Kentucky, it's sort of this country wisdom kind of guy, but he's got some brilliant things that he says. And one of the things he says is, when you wake up in the morning, if the first person you meet is a butthead, he doesn't actually say butthead, but you get the idea. He said, if the per first person you meet in the, in, in the morning is a butthead, well, there are buttheads in the world. But if every person you meet all day long is a butthead, then you're the butthead. <laughs> if every church you go to has a problem with their worship, 
then there's a real strong likelihood the problem isn't with the churches, but it's with you. Probably not having the right understanding of what worship is, not having the right priorities, uh, you know, expecting that it's all about me, that they're, they're there to meet my needs, to help me uh, feel satisfied with that. Questions about that? Yes? Can I share something that I thought was kind of something to think about? That sure. I see it on the internet. It's uh, Gordon B. Hinckley from Family Share. He wrote down the trouble with most of our prayers is that we give them as if we were picking up the telephone and ordering groceries. <laughs> we place our order and hang up. We need to meditate, contemplate, think of what we are praying about and for, and then speak to the Lord as one man speaketh to another. Good. I like that. Yeah, the model that I've often used um, when I've taught about, about prayer is the ACTS model, which you're probably familiar with, A-C-T-S. And I really like it because it not only includes all the elements, but it puts them in the right order. A stands for adoration. We spend time simply praising God, adoring Him, acknowledging who He is. The second letter, C, is for confession. Confess our own sins, admit our own unworthiness, that His mercy to us is undeserved. T stands for thanksgiving, thanking him despite our unworthiness for all the gifts he gives us and all the blessings. So adoration, confession, thanksgiving. And only then do you get to supplication. Supplication is a fancy word for asking for stuff. And that even at that, when we get to supplication, we should make sure that our first supplications are for other people before we start saying what we want, asking for the needs of others. And if we'll do, if we'll do that, if our prayers include all of that, adoration for God, confession of sin, thanksgiving for his blessing, and supplication for others first and then for ourselves, then our prayer life will be significantly changed. But you're right. Most of it, as we've said before, it's like most people conceive of God as being some cosmic bellhop. And we ring our little prayer bell and the whole thing is a list. It's like, you know, it's like Santa Claus and he's going to bring us all the things we want. That's not real prayer. That's not... The prosukumai, that's not inviting God into our lives, inviting, you know, recognizing that He is there and for us to be in communion with Him in whatever it is in our lives. Uh, a very different kind of approach. So now you guys, all four of you, get a chance to talk. <laughs> what do we mean, based on what I've said, when we say that worship practices are theological? I told you guys a little while ago, so you should know this. Well, it, it's ultimately who God is, the theology of who God is, and our relationship to God, and at least that. I'm yep. sure there's more of my esteemed colleagues here. My esteemed colleagues. It's like a, um, yeah, I think recognizing that we start with worship. The church has always started with worship, before it had written theology. That worship is theological in the sense that, that how we pray, you know, lex randi, lex credendi, how we pray, how we worship, is how we believe. And that worship is where it starts. And that, in fact, theology, the writing, you know, the cognitive theology and the writing theology comes later. And it's theological in the sense that it is in worship that our knowledge of God, theology, um, occurs. More so than in cognitive written stuff. So it is theological because that's where theology, you know, a knowing of God, knowledge about God, which is what theology is, that's where that really happens. You know, the rest of it is just is academic, not that I have a problem with academic, but um, it's much more fundamental, much more rooted in reality and truth, the theology that exists when God is present in worship and that we know him there. Yes? I agree with that, but I also think that... that Understanding the theology, you know, the attributes of God, etc., the character, the nature and character of God, in my case, has really, studying that has really helped me in my worship. Right. Because it gives you a, it gives you a broader sense of all the things that God are, and then you can see all the things that God are just in your life. Yep. And therefore, it also helps you in your worship, to worship Him for all the things that He is. So yep. I find... I don't think you were saying that theology doesn't count, but I think... I hope not. I think it, <laughs> I think it grows, like you said, from the initial yeah. thing, but I think it, understanding those things are quite valuable to yeah. your worship. 
I agree. In fact, I would say there is an interplay between the experience of God in worship and the understanding of God in sort of cognitive theology. That, and that those things do support one another and they feed one another. But too many people think that theology is, you know, the, the written down book stuff and that worship is something different. And in fact, in, historically, there have been various movements within the church that, that particularly the fundamentalist movement in the United States. Weirdly enough, fundamentalism began at universities and seminaries, particularly Princeton. You know, B.B. Warfield and the earliest of the people who were fundamentalists. That name comes from the fact that they published a document which identified these are the fundamentals of our faith. And those who adhered to that were fundamentalists, but the people who wrote it were PhDs. Later on, when fundamentalism spread, especially in the South, where I'm from, they actually developed it into a sense that it's all about faith, it's all about worship, it's all about interaction with God, and that any cognitive stuff, especially academics, higher education, is actually bad. That that confuses you, that messes you up. And so don't do theology, just love God. You know? Absolutely, you don't believe that's true. I think there is an interplay. So this question, you know, is that too many people don't understand that worship, rightly done, is theological. God is present there. We learn of God in that. And that that is rightly understood. That is the source from which then theological thought and writing is properly developed. But yes, I believe that we have both of those things and there's an interplay there. I completely agree with that. Yeah, heaven forbid if I should think that cognitive theology is a bad idea. <laughs> How much effort have I put into that? You know, so, do you have something, Carolyn? Um, well, having been brought up in a fundamentalist church, it reminds me of our discussion, I think, last week in the ethics class about the, the, the three-legged stool or whatever it was. Ours was faith comes first, then facts, then feelings. You can't trust feelings at all. Not that they're you know, necessarily wrong or bad or evil, but you can't really trust them compared to first your faith, which is, I think, those list, that list of fundamentals probably would be yeah. that was. And then, and then if... Um, if the facts seem to disagree with your faith, you can't even trust facts. <laughs> and maybe that's where that whole right. distrust of education came in. But that, I mean, that wasn't what my church believed. They, they didn't have a distrust of education like you talked about. Yeah. But, um, but it was definitely secondary to what you knew about God. Right. Well, when, first in England and then in the United States, when the... Um, when the Protestant movement in the U.S., the fundamentalist movement, sort of morphed into the revivalist movement, feeling came first. Yeah. Now, they may not say that, but the fact is that the tent meetings across the South, people would go there and there would be, you know, loud preaching and loud music and altar calls and everybody get really worked up. And what would happen is the, these revival meetings would come through town and everybody get resaved kind of thing. They'd all get recommitted. They'd recommit their lives. And they'd all be sort of juiced up, emotionally juiced up. And that'd be fine. And then when the revival tent left town, they would start this sort of natural decaying of their, of their emotional, because that's going to happen. And then four, five, six months later, the revival tend to come back through town and everybody get there in our, another emotional charge. And so it was very feelings oriented. It was very, now again, they may not have said that, but the idea was that because there was such a focus on this emotional kind of recommitment of oneself, that you felt it, that um, you couldn't think too hard about it because that would mess up the whole point of all. And so that's, that's a lot of where that sort of uh, downplaying, not only downplaying, but actually negating the value of academia, of, of training, of ac theological training. You know, there were churches in the South that, that having even a college education would preclude you from ministry. They wouldn't have you because they think you've been polluted. Yeah, like I said, that wasn't the case in, in yeah. that church. And I think that faith was just sort of a shorthand for what is your theology. Exactly. Yeah. So that, that, that really was... Right. And, and what I'm describing there, by the way, is a minority. I'm not talking about there being a lot of places, but there were places like that where the revival circuits, and they, they talked about the revivalist circuits because sure. they come back through town a little while. Back around so everybody would recommit. 
to re-pump everybody up. Yeah, we're going to pump you up. Um, now, since, as we said, worship is dual-sided, something that happens between God and believers, that God calls and we respond, do you think a good way of thinking about the worship experience might be as a conversation between us and God, and what might be the strengths and weaknesses of such a model? Well, I think that, that we've talked about a conversation between us and God being prayer. I, that it's um, more ongoing than just, you know, when I'm going to pick up the phone and right. place my order. Here's what I need. Yeah. <laughs> um, that is, so I think that that's actually a strength, is if you consider it more ongoing. Right. A minute ago, I talked about prayer and worship. Remember mm -hmm. what I said about it? That they were virtually synonymous? We recognize that, that prayer and worship both are situations where God invites us to be in relationship with Him and we we respond and pursue that. That prayer may, you know, too often people's mis misunderstanding of prayer is because they think it's just us talking. Mm -hmm. God's sitting there passively listening and we tell Him stuff. And worst of all, if we just tell Him what we want, you know, but rather than there being a relationship. Well, because worship is God calling and us responding and us experiencing a time of relationship with Him. In many ways, I think that, that worship and prayer are synonymous and that worship can legitimately be called a conversation. As long as you don't mean conversation, it's just an exchange of words. If you mean it to be more of a communion, more of a relationship. Does that make sense? Any other comment about that? What might be strengths or weaknesses in that? I think, I mean, I agree very much that it, it should be a conversation between us and God. And I think beyond, even going beyond worship and prayer, just your life mm -hmm. is meant to be that. I right. mean, in other words, you might not be in constantly talking to the Lord, but the way you live will reflect that conversation with right. God. So it's kind of a all-encompassing, as far as I can see. Right. And the, you know, the prayer, the worship I mean, is vital. It's just, a, you know, but it, but I think it extends into you know the carrying it out and yeah. and reflecting God and all right. the rest of just a Christian. Yeah, it's a whole person kind of thing. Yeah. Carolyn, since I wasn't here for the first time, I'm going to dominate this. <laughs> worship, I think, also another word for worship is service, right? So if if we're serving God, if we're in effect, what we do is is done for God, um, or as if it were for God, like your work, your employment. That can be a worship experience itself if you're, if you're conscious of it. Yeah, service can be a, um, a kind of worship if, if we're mature, if we've you know, got a right understanding of that. Um, it's not always. It depends on how we understand it. I thought that that's what worship kind of meant, that, that there was another, another word for worship, a service, serving God. Like sacrifice, is <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, if you think of, if in terms of service we mean to give ourselves into God, you know, to give ourselves over, that sort of whole person kind of thing that, right. that, that Chris was just saying, then I think that's true. I think that the danger of a conversation with us and God, that the potential downside, not necessarily, is that we think it's just us, just talking. Oh, yes. you know, that's, that's when, if we think a conversation is just like a telephone conversation, you know, I say what I want, he says something, I say something, he says something, and we hang up, then that would be a problem, because it really does need to be, conversation might, might be better replaced with the word interaction, you know, an ongoing interaction because it is a whole person kind of thing. And in that regard, then service is an aspect of worship. Okay, what are some specific ways in which your culture affects or infects the way you worship? Is it a problem? Is it an opportunity? I've talked about that some. What do you guys think? What have you experienced? How has cultural kinds of things manifested themselves in worship, either to positive or to negative? By cultural, you mean other churches we may have attended? And the way they worship and pray. No, I think culture would be like Western culture, American culture, or Mexican culture. You know, the the world in which we live every day. Um, example would be, you know, our culture, television and music and and movies and you know, 
know, fashion and um, you know, the, the, the culture of shopping, you know, the commercialism, uh, materialism. You know, what other parts of, of the world we live in, that's what we mean by culture. Not church, but outside church, the world we live in. What aspects of that do you feel has influenced, affected, positively or negatively, worship and the church? I guess that would be materialism, what you worship, the culture that you're you're living in and they show this something on TV and it's like you've got to have this. And so you're praying, oh God, please let me have this. Wouldn't that be considered a negative effect right. of worship? Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Yes. <laughs> exactly. Carolyn and I watched Castle last night, the latest episode of Castle, and He's very funny, and I, you know, he seems like a good guy. But he's got a new Ferrari, and they're looking for this Rolls Royce that this bad guy has dumped. And he, so he goes to a place where they're selling exotic cars. And as he's walking along, there are all these, you know, Ferraris and Maseratis and Lamborghinis, etc. And he's walking along, and he goes, want it, want it, want it, need it, want it. You know, that's a kind of thing. How much does that infect our understanding? We say that, that, that the tithe and offering is an act of thanksgiving. And in that way, it's an act of worship. Well, people in our church have been very generous to help, you know, to give, to build this church, and to do the many other things we're talking about. But, as I may have said it in classes you guys have been in, they've said that if the Christians, and by that they're defining people who attend church regularly, if the Christians just in the United States would all give 10% to the church, then the Christian church in America could feed everyone on the planet, provide clean water and sanitation and education to everyone on the planet, just from the United States. Well, we ain't doing it. So to what extent does that reflect <coughs> particular cultural influences? Yeah, well, I mean, the culture of the West fundamentally seems to be rather selfish, in my opinion. Seems I mean, to be. <laughs> it is. Quite <laughs> but, you know, it's like, it's very me-centered. And, and in some of the other parts of the world, it's quite different. You know, it, but it's, it's getting more American, I think. But, but that just kind of goes against Christianity, really, fundamentally, that it's all about me, or I need this, or, you know, I want the best, blah, 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 uh, or my country is the best, you know, all of it, it just kind of bleeds out, it's, it's anti-Christ, in my opinion. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I think, as far as how it affects our worship, I, I think it just affects us as people, and it, our mentality, our you know, what we value, what are, you know, and in that it really affects our faith in Christianity, which I'm sure then, I'm sure, sorry about that, it, it affects our our worship, of course. It, right. It, that was my fault. You told me I would be blaming you. Okay. <laughs> I turned my phone off and on. Oh, okay. But I think it's just the whole culture has, right. has affected Christianity. I mean, and I think you see that um, I'll be gentle here. I mean, the way people look at their politics, or the way they think their country should, you know, rule the world, or all of these sort of things. Yeah. I mean, I think Western culture, and specifically American culture, really damages Christianity right. and the Christian witness. Yeah, we defame the name of Christ in so many ways. Yeah, um, Sunday I preached from Matthew 25 doing a series on this where Jesus said I was a stranger and you invited me in well the cover picture on the bulletin which Carolyn found is the, the metal uprights of the wall the fence between in, near Tijuana between Mexico and the US and someone had written sideways on this because they're the sort of rust colored metal slabs you know pieces that go up 15 feet or something um, I was a stranger and you invited me in Jesus well that was the cover of the bulletin and I just commented that, um, you know, every, every sociologist, 
Every economist that has looked at the situation in America says that without the strong work ethic and strong backs of Mexicans who have come to the United States, whether legally or illegally, that our economy in the U.S. could not survive. And I mean, everybody that knows anything about it has agreed on that. And so, and yet, and one study I saw said that within, by the year uh, 2020, the U.S. government was going to have to be paying Mexicans to come to the United States to work, because there's now more people returning to Mexico than there's going to the U.S. And when I said that, a good number of people applauded in our congregation, and half of them had scowls on their face. <laughs> right? So, yeah, I was a stranger, and you invited me in, uh, kind of thing. What, what is our culture saying to us? Carol? Completely different way that culture affects worship, I think, is short attention spans. I'm that, sorry, what did you say? <laughs> you, <laughs> your mind drifted. Well, at this time, I get it. Um, yeah, I, I think that our culture, our entertainment culture affects worship, and we feel like we have to have something going on all the time that keeps people focused. Right. And um, I, this, is, this is embarrassing to say, but now that I don't sit with the choir, that I sit back here, it's hard for me to keep focusing. Uh, the whole time. And this and, is my wife. I know. And I'm not just talking about the sermon either. Okay. You know, just in general. You know, people are walking out back here and in back and back yeah. looking. And it's not easy. Short attention span, I think, is, I think is partly cultural. Yeah, I it's think, true. I, I, I remember uh, one of the few professional basketball games I ever went to, I went with a friend to the Seattle Supersonics. They're not even in Seattle anymore. And we're in a key arena. And it's like every time the whistle would blow, there was a timeout, or there was anything that took more than 15 seconds away from the actual playing of the game, there was something else going on. It's like they would have cheerleaders out there dancing for everybody, or they would have bringing kids out to shoot free throws, you know, to win a prize, or they would have a, they had a drone, it was the first drone I ever saw, it was actually a kind of a balloon drone, that they had going over dropping t-shirts on people. And so I'm sitting there thinking, People cannot sit for 30 seconds without something else to occupy their attention without there being a problem. I was just astonished by that. So, cultural. Yeah, I saw you look at your watch, Chris. No, I was, <laughs> the reason I was looking is because I wanted to say something, but I, I wanted to make sure I was looking. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> but I do have something to say. Yes. That's okay. I, I think the culture of entertainment, um, you know, it, it sort of affects certainly church and, mm -hmm. you know, but having said that, I think as church, we have to recognize that that's a fact. That people, their attention spans are very short. I mean, after all these years of television and et cetera, et cetera, just the way the culture is, but that's a fact. That also the thing about feelings, you know, that is a fact of life. You know, people are really, more oriented to what it means for me. Right. And I would think that as a church, like you don't want to like totally cater to all of that because then you've got like a three second sermon and in between your sermon and this, the guys are going to shoot hoops, you know, all that. Exactly. But then you have to recognize, I think it's wise to recognize that that is sort of how things are and therefore you can also adapt how you do church to sort of Get, sort of help people that are in that state or how that's how they are to kind of still really connect. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's why I, I like, I really love the whole thing. And, you know, I've sung them all my life. But I also work with young people who wrote beautiful songs, heartfelt. And I think the mixture is good because if I would just say, okay, today we're going to read, you know, the Rugged Cross and, or sing this, these three, they're not going to be so interested. If it didn't have a little more music to it than an organ, they're not going to be interested. And really, as pastors or you know people that are running church, I think you have to like also, you know, it's both sided. You have to keep it theologically right. You've got to you know do this, but you've got to have also try to pull people in so that they participate. And I think in there there's a balance. Right. With most yeah, I think you're exactly right, and I feel that tension. <laughs> on the, on the one hand. We, um, Carol and I met a couple on one of the cruises, 
and talking to them, and I always tell people I'm a pastor of the Presbyterian Church, and as we were talking to them, I don't even remember the context, but I remember the fellow, Pitt, was saying that they had been attending a church, and they ended up, they had been a um, plant, church plant, or like a, a satellite church from mm -hmm. another church. And then the mother church decided to close them down, and the reason they gave was because you're not attracting enough giving units. And then I remember Pitt kept talking, and Carolyn said, wait, I'm still back on giving units. <laughs> that a church was closed down because they didn't have enough giving units. Now, we have to, we have, to have people give in, so in order to support the church, right? Um, similarly, I, that's why earlier I was saying that uh, I don't, you know, I try to stay close to an hour. Because for our group, that's culturally appropriate. If I go an hour and 10 or an hour and 15, I'm not going to grieve over it. And I'm not going to let them grieve over it. <laughs> but if I started going an hour and 40 minutes every time, then, then I would begin to do what you're saying. I would begin to violate what's kind of the tacit agreement that we have. And so there's always a challenge. How much do you design church, worship, etc., the, the, the practical, the practices of it, to satisfy, to fit within the expectations people, you know, and how far can you push them, and how much responsibility do you have to try to educate them to a better kind of approach. There's always that challenge, always that balance, you know, and an attempt to try to get that. Um, I'm aware of that, I, I confess, you know, it's not like I'm conscious of it all the time, because I, I'm not going to be concerned about how many giving units we have. And you know what, I would rather, I would rather our church not grow, then we grow by doing the wrong stuff or doing it in the wrong way. Um, I don't think we've ever allowed ourselves to get into that. I mean, the fact is that I tell people from the pulpit sometimes stuff that I know a lot of them don't want to hear. And, and we all, not because I'm, I don't say that because I'm proud of that. It's just sometimes they need to hear something that they don't want to hear. Um, I think I got into that this past Sunday when I talked about the fact that even people in our church are sending out Facebook posts and emails and videos that are that express you know disdain or actual hatred or a despising attitude toward Muslims or, or Democrats or whatever. I mean, recently we had somebody forward this stuff. Didn't send it to me, but a woman in our church forwarded it to me, and you know, and, and the person that sent it and said, um, "Did you send this to Pastor Ross? I'm I'm forwarding it to him because I don't think this is what he." said when he talked about this. And, and so I talked about the fact that Jesus said, love your enemies. And I don't care if it's Muslims or whoever you think of your enemies, be it Democrats, Republicans, you know, uh, politicians. Canadians. What's that? Canadians. Canadians. <laughs> Before you post on Facebook or send an email or send out, you know, forward a video, ask yourself the question, does this reflect Jesus' command that I need to love somebody? Even if I think they're terribly dangerous, because, you know, the, in Scripture it says that, you know, you need to love your enemies even while they are persecuting you. Okay? So, there's no excuse. So, yeah, but how much do we let our culture affect that? Because everybody else is saying it, it must be okay for me to send this video saying, you know, that Muslims are all demonic. All right? Um, and that we need to, you know, we need to go to war against them. Um, what other worship practices, well, I don't want to get into that right now. Uh, that's a little bit too complicated. We've got the verses. Um, what do you think are the problems and opportunities provided for worship or worship leaders by media, movies, popular culture? How can we use it to our advantage versus what potential problems are there? When it comes to leading people in worship, are there any ways we can use it to our advantage? In our experience, we use movies, for example, Victoria uses in the, he, his preach, or she's preach movie, and everybody remembers that. One week, a week, one week late, everybody say about this movie. It's incredible. Right, and that's, you know, Chris saying there's just a reality that uh -huh. we are so oriented in that direction. How can we use some of those kinds of things without letting it overwhelm the stuff that may be more difficult that people don't want to hear as much, but they need to hear? How can we use that sort of thing in order to be able to make it more effective? Well, I think it's an opportunity in a way because um, it makes it, 
if you if you bring up something that is um, relates to a sermon that's from popular culture, it makes people think harder about pro popular culture. And anything that gets people to refocus with their short attention spans, I'm the first with the short attention span, I think it's helpful. If you, if you can start looking at, at movies or you know Facebook posts or whatever with a more critical eye through the eyes of Jesus, I think that that's going to be yeah. an, uh, an important thing. Well, and, and I agree with you. I think we need to be more aware. We talked about that earlier, you know, awareness of both the positive and negative. You know, positive meaning how can we use this to bridge more to others. Negative being what sort of nefarious influences may have crept in and we're not even paying attention enough to be aware of them. But are there, and I agree with, with all of that, are there ways that we can actually not only be aware, but actually use media kinds of things? I mean, the Spanish language congregation is using film clips, they're using... Um, they, the videos uh, with song lyrics and recorded music and things like that. Yeah. Are there other ways we can be doing that? Concerts. Concerts? Christian concerts. Okay. That will appeal to the older people and some that will appeal to the younger people. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that's the way they do things. They like the music and if that affects them that way to worship. Some with drums, some without drums, in other words. <laughs> um, yeah, and in, in fact, going even further with that kind of idea of, of like media and popular culture, we plan, we're, we are moving forward here with having an art gallery. Not just, not just Christian art, but we've got all these beautiful walls up here. We're going to fix, arrange the lighting in the hallways. We're going to, in fact, I think, you'll appreciate this, I think we're going to call it Paloma. Gallery and Cafe, because Paloma is a dove in Spanish. And then the Carolyn's come up with a logo, which is a dove. So the Paloma Gallery and Cafe at Lakeside Presbyterian Church. And I've got people who have experience in the arts that are going to be sort of curating and jurying the art that's submitted to put up. We're talking to some people about that. We want to have, as I say, movies and football here. You know, not to confuse those things with the worship, but the idea is getting people here. Having them have a good experience, meeting people who are part of the church, having a sense that there is quality here. In an art gallery, we've got a you know, baby grand piano to have concerts, various things of that sort. Um, those are not, unlike the Spanish language congregation, uh, I'm not talking about using those in the worship so much as being able to sort of create an environment where people have a different idea about church. Um, so those are all things we're looking at. Yes. I think that's a really good person. I mean, I think it, it, it helps to create community mm -hmm. and church. Like community, I mean, church is a community, but non-Christians who, especially who have issues about Christians and Christianity, if they can experience church as community and say that it's, I mean, you have your belief, you don't compromise on those, but, that, but that's not... That doesn't all, isn't always your focus when you're with non-Christians. It, it's right. like showing them the true Christianity. Right. Of, you know, all of the things that are, I think that will make a big difference. Yeah, Jesus ate with the tax collectors and sinners, and he didn't wait until they stopped being tax collectors and sinners right. before he did it. Um, Interesting, I, two weeks ago, I preached, I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. And I said, you know, we, as part of our feeding program, if we find people who don't have clean water, we'll address that. But to me, there are other places where Jesus talks about thirst as being spiritual thirst. You know, come to me and I will give you the living water, and if you drink of me, you will never thirst. And so I talked a lot about that, and I said that um, part of what you know, we as a church want to do is invite people here, get them here, you know, have them participate. Well, that same af late afternoon, I was reading an article in Christianity Today. The title of the article was Stop Inviting People to Church. So, of course, I had to read that. And the point was, the guy says, you know, I read all these things about invite your, you know, I hear all these sermons, and I invite your friends to church, invite your friends to church. He said, I want to tell you right now, stop inviting your friends to church. And he said, I mean it, I'm not kidding. Stop inviting them to church. And if you read through the article, he comes around and he says, instead of, he said, the people who want to be in church are in church. The people who want to go to church church are in church. The people who aren't coming to church are the people who don't want to be in church 
but they have other interests. He said, instead of inviting people to church, turn your church into something that people who aren't churchy people will want to come to. All right? That have other kinds of activities. A book that we've read and that I've recommended to a bunch of people, I don't know if Guillermo's read it, probably, that um, is by Michael Cheshire. It's called How to Knock Over a 7-Eleven and Other Ministry Training. And Cheshire, in that book, <coughs> writes about, he's very creative, he, they, he and his wife, who unfortunately they've since divorced, and a group of friends started a church in Colorado. And one of the things they did was all of these activities they have that are so outside the box in terms of churches. The, during the economic downturn, there were a lot of women who, need, who, single women who were working, who needed their cars to go to work, and their cars were breaking down, they couldn't afford to fix them. He had men at his church who knew how to fix cars, and so they started a car repair for them. First free, and then it became commercial. They started a restaurant cafe called the Angry Yama. Um, they wanted to get the men in the church more involved in church, and so they built a race car, because they had like a dirt track, as I remember, a racetrack near them. And so got all the men together, and they built a race car. And it was the church's race car. And on and on. All these different things that are so outside the usual thinking of the church box. And yet, in the process, with you know pretty much no money from the way they described it, they ended up starting and growing a church. So there's other ways we can approach things. That's some of what we're going to try to do here. Race card be fun. Any other questions or comments? I just have one. Sure. I'm more over caffeinated today. So <laughs> <laughs> but, um, in reading this book, The Theology of Worship, I found it really interesting where, I mean, this might sound a little dumb, but you know, where it had your, your offertory prayers and, and the different sort of things mm -hmm. that happen. That kind of explained to me this kind of structure. Why? Yeah, why did you the do why? it? why? And it maybe kind of made it more, you know, rather than sitting here, kind of, not no one could this part, but maybe kind of twirling your thumbs, because you don't quite get the picture. I think that really helped to kind of understand the structure. I can, I imagine, I mean, I would imagine that everybody in the church already knows that, and I was sort of the thing. But I think if, if people really understood, here's the reason, you know, we do this, and then we do this, and then, and this is all part of worship, because quite frankly, I think probably the majority of Christians, at least from my experience, think of worship as a praise and prayer time, or just even the praise. Yeah. And not, they're not looking at the sermon as part of worship in my, you know, the music. But it's the music. And that's kind of, you know, you have the worship leader. They lead music, that's what they do, yeah. Right. So I think if people, you know, it might be more effective if people really understood the whole service yeah. is worship, and these are the parts, and this is, you know, when we're taking an offering, we pray this prayer because, you know, they really understand it, and even if even to kind of explain it a little differently once in a while. Yeah. So it's not just rote, or it's not just this is the, the liturgy. But, right. I mean, it is a liturgy, but you kind of make it more... So they understand why. Exactly. And they yeah. really feel that, oh, well, I'm giving, now I'm, you know, I'm praying and I'm thanking, them. this is an you know, offering of thanksgiving. I think it would really change yeah. people's perspective and make things a little bit more relatable, and interesting, yeah. and you know, you might not be thinking about the game so much. Right, well I, from time to time, in various elements of, of worship, I will try to do that, you know, um, and I will say, now come to our time of confession, in which we, you know, confess our sins to God. Um, recently I had somebody tell me that they thought the, as far as they were concerned, the response of reading was just a waste, you know, I, I just have nothing to do with that, so this last Sunday. I, when, we, when I said, you know, now please remain standing for the response of reading. And I said, as we are in worship, as you read these words, take them yourself as a presentation to God. That you are lifting God up in his glory and majesty. And so use these as your words, as part of your worship. You know, so, I've tried to do some of that. But, you know, it's, it, it, there's a... Again, always a balance. There's a balance between how often can we explain things. I'll talk about the Apostles' Creed. You know, it's the oldest creed of our church. One of the earliest statements of faith. The roots of it come from the first century. 
and it is our way of saying here is what we believe. And those kind of things. But you know, there's a balance. If I tried to do all that all at one time for all the elements, then it would end up being a tutorial about the elements of worship. So we have to be careful. Okay. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it.